everyone, and welcome to Not Just Numbers, Honest Conversations with a Financial Advisor and Lawyer. I am Madison Demora, and I am here with Mike Gary. Mike is a financial advisor and a CFP and the founder and the CEO of Yardley Wealth Management. He is also an estate planning lawyer, and his law firm is Yardley Estate Planning. Hey, Mike. Hey, Maddie. How are you today? I'm good. How are you? Great. It's a beautiful, sunny day, summertime. Yep. Yeah. Nothing to complain Could, about. Couldn't be better. All right. So, Mike, we're doing things a little bit differently today. Do you want to explain to our listeners uh, how this episode is going to plan out? Sure. Instead of having Maddie and I talk about one topic and then have a guest, since we don't have a guest lined up, we're going to talk about three different topics, uh, articles that we saw in the press recently that are related. And we'll tell you how they're related at the end of the episode. Awesome. Build in a little suspense. Okay. All right. So like Mike said, there is three articles we are going to discuss. They are all from the Wall Street Journal, and you can always find them linked in the description below. So first, we are going to start with an article titled, Insurers are winning a fight to curb retirement saver aids. And this is by Jean Eaglesham. All right, so here's the summary. The article outlines a legal battle between the insurance industry and the U.S. government over a new labor department rule designed to protect retirement savers. The rule would re require financial advisors to act in the best interest of clients when recommending products like annuities, which often have hidden fees and high commissions. The insurance industry opposes the rule, arguing it would, it would limit consumer choice and hurt their profits. Critics believe the rule is necessary to prevent advisors from pushing costly products that may not benefit clients. Despite the initial court rulings in favor of the industry, the government is expected to appeal. All right, Mike. So what are the potential benefits and drawbacks for retirement savers if the fiduciary rule is implemented? Well, I think that there are a lot of benefits for investors. Um, I think it would be a great thing. So, you know, we are registered by the SEC as investment advisors. So we are fiduciaries 100% all of the time. And that's quite rare, as I've said repeatedly over the last 25 years. Um, the Department of Labor is trying to enforce a fiduciary standard for retirement savers. And part of that would be that the insurers who sell annuities would have to act with a duty of loyalty to their clients um, in their best interests and with um, good faith. And so it would have a hard time saying that uh, an annuity that has an 8% commission um, and the one person in the article said some go as high as 14% commission would be acting in the best interest of the client and that there's no other reasonable substitutes for that product. I think they'd have a really hard time. And so I think what would happen is uh, savers and um, people who choose to buy an annuity would pay much, much less for that product. So how might the new standard for financial advice affect the relationship between financial advisors and their clients? And in what ways could the rule change the way advisors recommend products? So I think that it would be a good thing. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> the people who sell the products now don't see it, right? Because they see it, you know, possibly losing out on 8% commissions, right? And it could be a lot. You sell a million dollar annuity, that's $80,000. That's a lot of money to make for a couple of signatures, right? But, um, you know, I, I started as a financial advisor at, at Merrill Lynch and was clearly not a fiduciary there. Um, and moving to the last firm I worked at in our firm, being a fiduciary is liberating for the advisor. You know, you're on the same side of the table as the client. You're trying to do what's best for them. And they know that. And they know that I'm not going to try to sell some product that has hidden fees or that's going to tie them up. And it, it makes the relationship so much better. You know, we, we're on the same side of the table now. So even though the those insurers or, you know, the agents or brokers who sell those products only look at the bad side now, I think, and there might be some pain, right? Like if you charge 
one or two percent on a product instead of eight percent, yeah, in the short run, it's going to stink for you. But I think ultimately it could be much better. And Maddie, I'm sorry, could you please repeat the the second part of that question? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and in what ways could the rule change the way advisors recommend products? Yeah, I think that the rule change would make advisors um, be more careful and diligent in looking into the products that they recommend. Um, and it'll be more based on what is best for the client and what is not part of a, a sales contest or the highest uh, commission that they can make. I, I think it would be a giant change for advisors. And and again, I think it would be a um it would be a giant change for clients. And again, I think ultimately it would be good for advisors and the relationships that they have with people. They just don't see it yet. Yeah. Seems like it might be around the corner though. Yeah, it's not ever gonna happen. <laughs> I've, they've been fighting it forever. Um so yeah. I, I can't see it. Now, maybe the, if the government wins in the ultimately in, in the lawsuit, but I can't see it. Yeah. Not optimistic. And, yeah. you know, we've had talks in the past. Uh, I've written blog posts and, and done videos where Merrill, my old employer, said that, you know, when the Department of Labor initially said there's going to be a fiduciary rule, um, which was uh, scrapped during the Trump administration, um, they said they were going to be first a fiduciary. And then when it got scrapped, uh, it was like a page, uh, an article in like page seven of the Wall Street Journal with a little thing that said, oh, you know what? We've decided this time we're not going to be fiduciaries. You know, um, I, I think that it, it would be hard for a publicly traded company to be a fiduciary because they have shareholders that they need to answer to. But I think there are enough smart people that they've figured out a way to do it. And I'm sure that that, that they have figured out a way to do it. Um, they just don't want to because they're always afraid of that short-term pain. And if they have problems with with revenues because they have to provide um, better products, then maybe they're going to get hurt in the stock market. And then that's going to hurt stock options, RSUs and all that stuff and the shares that they own. Um, so it's not ever going to happen until they're forced to do it. You know, it, in the last 25 years since I became an advisor, the vast majority of money in this industry has gone toward to Schwab, Vanguard, Fidelity, and independent advisors. Um, money that used to always go to the Merrill Lynch's, the Morgan Stanley's, UBS, Payne Weber, all the old brokers that like your parents would have heard of. All that money used to go to this doesn't go to them anymore, right? Consumers have found out that there are cheaper products and there are advisors that put their interests first and they're flocking to them. And I don't know what it will take for those old guard and companies to, to get up and, and notice and change, but it hasn't happened. Uh, I, I can't see it happen unless it's forced on them. And I don't think it'll ever actually be forced on them. And so that's where we're at. Yeah. <clears throat> good to be knowledgeable before looking for a financial advisor. Yeah, you should know. And people do now. I mean, people yeah. reach out to us. They ask us all the time if we're fiduciaries. And they're starting to know that to ask if we're fiduciaries all the time. Because a lot of advisors out there say that they're fiduciaries. But the reality is um, they're not all the time. So if you want to look, the easiest way to know if the advisor you're checking out is a fiduciary Look at their website, and if they have like tiny little disclaimer print saying that securities are offered by such and such company and products are offered by some other company and they're unaffiliated, that person is not going to act as a fiduciary to you. They just are not going to um, because of the relationships they have with those companies that, that are in that little size four font at the bottom of the website. Yep. Absolutely. Easiest way to know. Yeah. All right. So what impact could the rule have on the sales of annuities, particularly fixed indexed annuities? Yeah, well, I, I think that the sales of annuities um, would change the giant projection that they've had now. You know, so I think 2024 was a record year that crushed 2023. That was a record year. You know, hundreds of billions of dollars of annuities sold. I think that if an advisor had to worry about um, the government checking to see if what they sold was really in the best interest of their client. I think a lot of those products would become a lot cheaper or they would go out of business. They would just stop selling them. Yep. 
So why do you think the insurance industry is so confident that it will win the legal battle? Because they always have. You know, it's... <laughs> yeah. Like there, there have been short instances of time where it looked like they might lose, and but they haven't. Okay. <laughs> yep. And they're gonna, they're gonna, um, they framed the decision as choice. You want to give people choice. Um, it's the same thing that that other um, industries that have fallen out of favor will say. You want to give smokers a choice. You want to give, I don't know, gamblers a choice. Um, yeah. Okay. All right. So what role do transparency and simplicity play in helping savers make informed decisions? Well, I think those are the two, two of the most important things. Like what is the product you're buying and how complicated is it? You know, like if something's complicated, I generally would steer clear of that, right? We want simplicity and transparency. What is it? How does it work? If you can't explain it very simply, it's probably too complicated of a product and I'd steer clear. Okay, good advice. Mm -hmm. What are the broader implications of this legal battle for the future of financial advice in the retirement sector? Well, I think the, the broader implication is that if the government were to win and um, advisors would be held to a uh, fiduciary standard, I think that it would it would make a lot of logical sense for other times when advisors have relationships with clients that they should be held to a fiduciary standard. Right. And like I think that um I think that advisors should always act as fiduciaries. Um, you know, and that, that's a struggle. It's a war we've been waging for a long time. So I, I think that that's the big thing. And so we'll see. I'm not optimistic, uh, but you know, you never know. Yeah. Keep we will fighting. See. Yeah. Keep hoping. Yeah. And even if it doesn't, just hopefully, you know, the people just get more educated and know what to look for. Yeah, like the the amount of people that that know to look for a fiduciary advisor has grown dramatically in the last 10 or 15 years. And hopefully that keeps going. And I mean, ultimately that would be the other thing that would make them change, right? If they just couldn't get any more business um, yeah. that would make them change. Yeah. Although that's not the case, right? If they sold more than $200 billion of those um, high price annuities last year, a lot of people are still buying them. And that's why yeah. we make this podcast, trying yeah. to get less people to buy those products. Yeah. So have you seen an increase in people? Like, you know, you have your prospects come in. Have you seen an increase of, you know, asking if you're a fiduciary all the time? Was it common, you know, when you first started compared to now? So when I first started, no one knew what it was and no one ever asked. Um, but they did ask about being fee only, right? Which is generally a mm -hmm. part of it. Most fiduciary advisors are also fee only. Um, but somewhere around 10 years or so ago, I think, People started to ask about fiduciary a little bit more often. Um, and we get asked fiduciary now more than fee only. And um, it, it definitely has increased. And I think, you know, people like do a little bit of homework and look at a couple of articles, you know, go online and they see the difference. You know, it, it you know, there's conflicts of interest in every business model, but there are many fewer uh, when the person you're acting with is, um, has a legal obligation to act in your best interest. Yeah. Right. Like, <laughs> well, that's good news. You know, people yep. are getting educated on it and the word's getting out. So that, that's great news. Yep. All right. So I guess we will switch gears. We will go move on to the next article. So this one is titled the fees on these funds will leave you high and dry. And this is by Jason Zweig. All right. So here's the summary. The article criticizes interval funds, which limit investor withdrawals to periodic intervals, marketed as a way to prevent panic selling in liquid assets. These funds often come with high fees that can significantly reduce returns. They commonly invest in private credit and real estate, using leverage that increases both potential returns and risk. The article warns that some managers charge fees on 
borrowed funds potentially encouraging riskier investments. It questions the value of interval funds given their high cost and limited liquidity compared to more transparent and liquid alternatives like high yield bond ETFs. All right, Mike, so what are the potential advantages and disadvantages of the limited liquidity offered by interval funds? And how does this structure compare to other investment vehicles like mutual funds and ETFs? Sure, so there are a couple of big differences. So for these interval funds, they buy things that are not nearly as liquid as stocks and bonds. So they will buy um, private loans, they'll buy real estate, and they'll, you know, they'll buy things with margin, right? So they'll borrow money to buy more of it. Um, and those are things that are not easily sold. They can't sell quickly. Um, you know, so liquidity is a measure of how, how much loss there would be if you had to sell something immediately. So if we were um, having to, to sell um, a publicly traded stock, right? Say we need to sell Apple stock. It is as liquid as possible. I mean, there, there's um, a lot of shares trade hands every day and there will be no loss of, in value of what we're trying to sell if we had to sell some. And so that's why most mutual funds and ETFs are okay with having constant liquidity. And it's not great. They don't love it because every day, if um, money is come pouring into the fund, people are buying more, they have to buy shares, even if they don't think it's as good a deal as it might have been a couple of months ago. Or if the fund is doing poorly or the stock market is doing poorly and people want their money and they have to sell something, it, it might not be an opportune time. And so they have to make sales. And I think every manager of a mutual fund and ETF uh, struggles a little bit with you know the money coming in and going out like that. The interval fund, though, limits that by limiting the amount of uh, money that can go out of the fund, usually like 5% per quarter or something. And so that's something that is easier for them to deal with and, and less disruptive. And they need that, they say, because, you know, if they have um, a big commercial real estate, you know, transaction, or they, they own a bunch of properties and they have some loans that are non-traditional, meaning like they're not part of a bank or or between, you know, like a, a consumer and and what they, you know, a product that they buy. It's not that easy to get rid of those things, right? You know, you don't want to have to like, if you have if you have a fund and they own twenty hotels and a lot of people want their money out, you don't want to necessarily have to sell a hotel, and if you do, you can't sell it in a day. <laughs> Um, so, so it's a very different structure and, um, that, that's the reason why you'd have different, you know, daily liquidity for mutual funds and ETFs versus, you know, quarterly liquidity for those kinds of funds. Okay. How might the limited redemption options and in interval funds affect investor behavior during market downturns? And do you think this structure helps or hinders investors in managing their emotions and decisions? Well, I think, I'm not sure how it, how it actually works, but I think the idea is that if you know you can only get your money out at a certain time and that it's supposed to be a long-term investment, hopefully that makes people think like, okay, well, you know, I can only, I can only get 5% out at the end of the quarter. I'm just going to have to stick with this because I know there will be ups and downs. And um, hopefully it's a good thing, although I don't know. I've never bought one. And Yeah. All right. So the article discusses the high fees associated with interval funds, including charges on borrowed assets. How do these fees impact investors' returns and why might fund managers structure fees in this way? Well, they structure fees in that way to make more money. So that, that's the easiest answer. 
Um, and so, yeah, they're, they're high fees. You know, they might, might charge you some percent to get in and then they charge uh, several percent and then they might charge um, more if they um, make money. Like there was a quote in the article where it said um, it could be that the fund uses leverage or like borrows to buy a, a loan and the loan pays 12 percent. But the the part of that that gets down to the to the end client is only five percent because of the different layers of fees and the borrowing costs. Like the loan, it's hard not to to look at it cynically. Look, I, I went to law school, so I could be as cynical as anybody, right? When the, when they're charging on the like they're, when they're charging on the amount borrowed and the money they use to borrow it, um, it makes them take you know, risky thing, risky bets. Um, but it rewards that by letting them, it seems almost like double billing, right? They're, they, they're billing on an inflated amount because they could buy more because of the loan. So I don't love that aspect for sure. Yeah. Almost kind of sounds a little bit like gambling. Aspect. Oh, it sounds a lot like gambling. Yeah. But, but yeah. in this case, the fund managers are the house. Yes. What happens? Who loses? <laughs> House doesn't lose. Yes. All right. So what are the risks and potential rewards of using leverage in interval funds? How does this leverage affect the overall risk profile of these investments? Sure. I think it makes them riskier. Um, yeah, I, it just does. In in investing, the only, the only um, leverage that seems to be acceptable is like the leverage people use to buy a house because you put the down payment and and your your gains are levered because you're not investing all of the money you're buying but any kind of like stock bond investing borrowing money adds to the risk yeah how transparent are interval funds about their fee structures and risk do you think investors fully understand the cost and potential downsides when investing in these funds? Uh, they're not transparent at all, and investors don't understand the downsides. Thanks for that easy question, Maddie. I appreciate that sometimes. <laughs> of course. Given the rise in popularity of interval funds, why do you think there is a growing demand for alternative assets? Are these alternatives worth the additional risk and costs compared to traditional investments? I don't believe that they are. And I believe that the rise is because advisors used to be able to sell um, products based on like mutual fund performance or um, other kind of performance. And now that the S&P 500 is out there and has had such great performance compared to, to most other managers, uh, I think a lot of advisors are trying to sell alternatives as a different way of capturing client dollars. So they can't say, we're gonna buy this S&P 500 fund and charge more for it because investors can just do that on their own but they can say oh we're going to buy this it's it's not correlated so it's going to be less volatile than the s p 500 and you're going to have downside production protection right so so they can't in good faith say that they're going to buy these investments are going to beat the market so what they're going to do instead is they're going to try to sell investors these expensive, complicated products to do something else. And, you know, the other things are like um, provide returns that don't have as much risk or provide returns that um, have some sort of floor. So there's less volatility and there's less chance they're going to go down. I personally don't think it's worth it. I think having a globally diversified portfolio makes a lot more sense. And if, if you, um, client needs or wants bonds in the portfolio that could do something to dampen the risk a little bit. But I think that having the volatility of a globally diversified portfolio um, is worth the risk. Now, I'm not saying the volatility of the S&P 500, because I don't think most people really could take that. Um, you know, in the last 24 years, it's gone down by 50% twice. Um, 
know, and and two of those times was within a decade. Um, and it's gone down 20, 30% several more times than that. So I don't think people really want that kind of um, volatility, certainly not once they get within five or 10 years of retirement. Um, so I'm not saying just buy the S&P 500. I think it's a nice start to a portfolio, but I think it should be complemented with small cap and value stocks and foreign and emerging markets, probably some real estate and some bonds, depending on the client. So you said right. downturn protections. What is what is that? Yeah. So what they'll say is, uh, so say one of those times the S&P 500 went down by 50%, right? So say you have an, a, a, a million dollars in S&P 500 fund and it's September 2008. And you look up February 2009 and you have $450,000 in that same S&P 500 fund. Well, nobody likes that. That, that stinks, right? So people want to have the upside of the S&P 500, but they don't want the downside. And so what some of these funds will say they do is you know, buy you protection. So you may limit your upside a little bit, but you'll limit your downside even more. And so maybe if the correction happens where the S&P goes down 55%, your fund will only go down 20 or 30 or 40 percent and so people try to sell some sort of down downward protection like that okay all right how do interval funds compare to other high yield investment options such as public high yield bond etfs in terms of risk return and liquidity is the extra yield offered by inter interval funds worth the trade-offs yeah, so I don't think that it is, right? So this interval funds will offer higher yields, but you know, you give up uh, knowing what's in them. You know, you lose transparency, you lose liquidity um, for that yield. I don't think it's worth it. Uh, some people do, and I'm sure maybe if you found one that had reasonable fees and it used either didn't use leverage or had leverage that was acceptable to you, I think that it could be a part of a portfolio. Um, but but again, I, I just think that they charge so much for these products and they make it so hard to take money out. It's hard for me to, to, to really seriously consider putting clients money in them. Yeah. All right. So how important is it for investors to be educated about the intricacies of investment products like interval funds? What steps can financial advisors and industry professionals take to ensure investors make informed decisions? Yeah, so they, you need to be able to explain what a product is in a way that someone without product knowledge can understand. Um, and you need to have a way of showing what, what the risks and the volatility are like, not, not necessarily the volatility, but the risks so that people can understand them so that they can make informed decisions. And I think that um, so far, I haven't seen any kind of language that that would do that. But I think it's hard, right? Because they're going to have some legal requirements from the states that they're registered in or the SEC or, or whoever is, is monitor, monitoring them. And then there's going to be limits, you know, by like their uh, compliance lawyers as to um, how easy that language is to read. Now, I, I think it, you're stuck right now in a situation where you have products that are complicated and people don't understand them. So um, advisors who sell them try to explain them in a way that makes them enticing um, and limit the downside that they com that they discuss with clients. That's what I think anyway. Otherwise, I don't see why these would be booming in popularity. Yeah. I don't. Yeah, absolutely. All righty. So we are moving on to the third and final article here. This one is what Bill Ackman got wrong with his bungled IPO. And this is by Jason Zweig. All right. So here's the article. The article critiques Bill Ackerman's canceled close end fun, Pershing Square USA, PSUS. Ackman intends PSUS to mirror his main hedge funds holdings. Closed end funds, while suitable for long-term investing, often have high fees and could be difficult to trade at fair prices. PSUS 
plan to charge a 2% annual management fee and a 1.5 sales charge, making it unattractive compared to low-cost ETFs and mutual funds. Despite Ackman's strong track record, potential investors were deterred by the fund's expense structure, leading to its cancellation. The article argues Ackman missed an opportunity to innovate with low, lower fees and bypass traditional investment banking channels. It highlights broader issues with close-end funds, such as high fees and reduced investor control due to recent rule changes. All right. How do the average annual expenses of closed-end funds at 2.83% compared to those stock or bond index funds at 0.05% or less? Well, I think you just said it. They're like 50 times more expensive. Yeah. Um, and that that's a recent thing. I think that there were, so index funds haven't always been this cheap. Um, they've always been cheaper than average mutual funds, but they haven't always been this low. Um, and then closed ed funds became more expensive I think he was saying like maybe 10 years ago when they started to use leverage and, and they became more expensive. I think the spread between the costs has gone up dramatically in the last 10 years. Yeah. So why do close end funds often trade at a discount to their net asset value? So that's a good question. Um, it's probably because it's you know based on supply and demand and um, the demand is not out there. People don't think they're worth what the net asset value says, probably because of maybe not great returns and high fees. Um, it's interesting, even before the, the change in the closed end market, when I worked at Merrill 25 years ago, my boss used closed end funds a lot and he um, would try to, to tell clients they were, they were good and he thought they were good. Um, because they sold at a discount to their ADV. He said, you know, you're getting uh, $10 worth of companies for, you know, $9 and 80 cents. Like it makes a lot of sense because there, cause there's a discount. Um, but as the article explained, there has always been a discount and roughly like 80% of closed end funds are trading at a discount. And so it's not a, a case where you're going to buy tuna fish because it's on sale and you know you're getting that discount if you buy it because of the discount and hold it for 10 years and it's still trading at a discount the discount did you no favors yep what opportunities did bill ackman miss by not innovating with lower fees and a direct to individual investors approach for psus you know i think jason's why i made a great point he said you know if he priced it at um half a percent and didn't have a commission charge, then um, I think people would have clamored for it. It would have been a new thing really to have reasonable fees on a closed end fund. Then people you know, would be able to get what, you know, something similar to the hedge fund that would have been so much more expensive. Um, and he thinks it would have ushered in a new era of innovation on Wall Street. He said instead by bungling it and charging those higher fees and, and eventually like not even coming through with it, he said he just cemented Wall Street's uh, typical way of working and, and uh, high fees and, and uh, extra costs for the sale. It was, okay. it was a good point Jason made, and he made it much better than I did. <laughs> All right. What are the potential consequences of the proposed rule changes by the New York Stock Exchange and SIBO Global Markets, BZX Exchange on closed end funds shareholders. Yeah, it'd be terrible. It, the, the proposed regulations would uh, no longer require an annual shareholder meeting. So if you're an investor in the fund and um, you know had had some concerns or issues, there would be no uh, meeting where shareholders can attend and voice those concerns. You would be left with either just being stuck doing what you're doing or selling out and maybe you can't sell for tax purposes or you know you have a lot of other good reasons to hold um, and you can't in any way voice your displeasure i think it'll be be terrible for investors yeah and just a bad yeah. idea in general yeah. people should be able to voice their concerns with your fund 
Absolutely. All right, my last question here. How can closed end funds become more appealing to modern investors while maintaining their structure? Yeah, they need to charge lower expenses. And if there's any kind of commission charges to get them, they need to um, get rid of those too. You know, if they charged normal expenses and not the 2.83% on average or whatever, I think they would get a lot more people interested in them because, you know, there are advantages in the structure of buying and selling it, right? There aren't the capital gains that you would have. It's the, be the similar advantage of exchange rate of funds compared to mutual funds. Yeah. Um, but uh, they've gone away. They've gone the other way of trying to make it complicated and more like a, more like an alternative investment and charging those higher fees. Yeah. All right. Well, that's a wrap. So, Mike, is there a common thread between all of these articles? There sure is. I hope people see it. These are all instances, right, where people have complicated products that they charge a high amount for, that they charge high ongoing fees for, that they make it hard to redeem your money. There's no transparency. There's no liquidity. There's high fees. These are all things that um, should not be a part of your discussion when you're determining what you should buy. You know, I've said it before. I'll keep saying it. You should have a globally diversified portfolio for just about everybody who invests. And you should be able to buy and sell the funds when it's right for you. It shouldn't be locked up. Costs should be reasonable. And, um, you know, like, again, uh, that oh, I don't know who it was, but it was an old Fortune or Forbes editor who wrote years and years ago that I saw. I don't know if it was in college or just starting in this business. It's like buy stocks or bonds or funds that buy stocks or bonds. Anything more complicated was made to enrich the intermediary, the fund companies. So stay away. All so right. thank you for indulging me and going go through three different articles, mm -hmm. but you know, they're all, all pretty recent and they all seem to, to, to me have that common thread and yeah, it's just seemed to make absolutely. sense to do this at one time. Absolutely. Thanks, Maddie. Okay. Thank you. For more information on Yardsy Wealth Management or Yardsy Estate Planning, you can visit our website at yardsleywealth.net and yardsleyestate.net. You can also follow us on socials at Yardsy Wealth Management. This podcast has been produced by Madison Demora and Mike Gary with technical and artistic help from Poe Productions.